you must remember to instantly react. Because if someone slips back and you say nothing, they're just going to keep slipping back and other people will follow them. Welcome to your intended message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, one, one to few, or one-to-many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one-to-self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today, is Andy Bounds. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Andy. One, he is an award-winning sales consultant. He was voted the UK's Sales Trainer of the Year as a result of the sales that he helped his clients win, and wait for it, over $35 billion so far. That's impressive. And I wish I had a piece of that. And second fact, Andy's a best-selling author. His three books on leadership, communication, and sales are international bestsellers. In fact, the his first book only was kept out of the number one spot on Amazon because of the final Harry Potter book. You can't beat Harry Potter. <laughs> and three, Andy's mother is blind. And what that means is it's given him a lifetime experience of communicating from the other person's point of view. That's a critical skill for leaders to have because other people don't see. They're blind to what you see. Andy Bounds, welcome to your intended message. George, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you. It's delighted to be talking with you across the pond. And on this whole concept of leadership communication, what are some of the other lessons you learned from your mother on communicating? Well, many of them, but the most important thing is other people, whether physically in my mother's case or metaphorically in other people's cases, they don't see the world the way we do. So a leader may say to her team, okay, everyone, here's our new strategy. It's very exciting. I'm looking forward to us throwing ourselves into it. We're going to have an incredible year. But the other side of it, people are going, I'm already busy. When do you want me to do this? I don't have time. I'm not even sure how it will benefit me. And we see this thing so often that people say things that from their side, it looks fine, but the other person doesn't see it the same way. So the main thing I learned from my mum is it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what she thinks. And I need to lift myself up and put myself in her shoes to say things that she finds helpful. And surely that's the thing all good leaders should do. And... That analogy, of course, is an important analogy that leaders uh, need to understand. How did they put themselves in the other person's shoes? What do they have to do? Where do they start? Well, there's various things you can do, but two very good ideas are guess and ask. So by guess, I mean have a thing, you know. The person you're talking to, it might not be their business, but it might be yours. So they probably don't care as much. They probably don't get paid as much. They probably don't wake up thinking about it in the morning. They probably want to get home away from the job, whereas for you as the leader, you might not be able to get. So there's an element of educated guesswork. But the other thing, George, and this is so important, is to, if you want your intended message to land, it's asking the other people what they need to hear, you know? So if I was going to talk about a new strategy to my team, I would speak to them beforehand and say, I want to share the new strategy with you. What do you want to hear about it? Is there anything you're concerned about? Is there anything you want me to talk about? How would you like me to do it? Do you want a round table or do you want a big town hall thing? You know, so if you have an educated guest and also you ask people, it gives you a nice, balanced idea about what they might want. 
if we do what people normally do, put our little blinders on and go, what's my message? What is it I want to say? What are my three take-home messages? We aren't lifting our head up and asking enough. So that's a long answer in two words, guess and ask. Guess and ask. And yes, I recall some of my corporate life where we were summoned to a meeting and someone spoke at us and we all walked away thinking, what the heck was that about? As yeah. if we're, as if they, he <laughs> thinks we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you try and be positive, don't you? But sometimes you can just think, oh, just kill me now. You know, this is not fun at all. Um, and very often I will get called in by leaders to say, I need to do a road show and share this new strategy, help me create it. And sometimes, George, I get called in by people who say, three months ago, we did a road show, the wonderful strategy for the year, the vision, it seemed to go okay, but three months down the line, nothing has changed, help me fix it. You know, then clearly it's better if you get it right first time than running around three months later with everyone feeling as you and I did, where we came out of those meetings thinking, oh, that was horrible. Now, let's take the case of a roadshow. Perhaps it's a show that the leader wants to take around the, the corporation. Perhaps it's across the country or maybe even across borders. Mm -hmm. How does that leader cater that roadshow, that message, that presentation to those different peoples in different locations who probably think differently or see the world differently? Sure. So there's various things that you can do, but one of the ways to get early buy-in from each group is to say something early that that group will buy into. So if you're talking to a group of people and they happen to work in the call center, your opening sentence probably needs to be something about how to make the call center more fun and more successful. And then you can give your message, but keep linking it back to the call center's fun and success. If the roadshow then takes you to go and speak to the finance department, they might be more interested in the financial returns and the fact they're going to improve. So you start by talking about that, and then you give your message, link it back to the finances. I mean, you mentioned my mother in the introduction, George. One thing I learned about from her, and this is a great rule for life, it's not just being a mum, is if you want other people to really find you fascinating, find out what they're interested in, and then talk about that, you know? So if you go to a call center, start with the call center and then tie your message into that. If you're talking to finance, start with finance. If you're talking to a sales team, you say, and obviously I do a lot of that, when you talk to a sales team, the main thing salespeople want are more sales, okay? And or more opportunities and or more time and or to enjoy their job more. I mean, that's pretty much any sales team wants some or more of those four things. So the leader, when they do the roadshow to the sales team, should start by mentioning some of those and how the strategy will help with those, and then they do it that way. So it's the same strategy talk, but it's how you set it up to start with which matters. And I'm hearing a couple key points there. One is you don't deliver the same script to different audiences because different audiences see the world differently. And two, knowing what's important to people and talking about that, now they'll listen. And so the analogy that comes to mind is if you're talking to cat people, talk about cats. They don't want to hear about dogs. If you're talking to dog people, talk about dogs. They don't want to hear about cats. <laughs> and, how, and it's so obvious when you say it, but people don't do it. They take the same presentation and what we say in the UK, lift and shift. You know, they lift it and they shift it to the next room, lift it and shift it. And a very simple thing to do. George, is call it what you were going to call it, same slide one, same the rest, but on slide one, just change the subtitle. So if your main title is called next year's strategy, the subtitle will become and how it helps dogs. And then the next one, and how it helps cats and how it will increase sales. So that it's 90% the same, but just make little changes. It's like when people talk about an elevator pitch. And I think you don't just have one elevator pitch. It depends who's in the elevator with you. You know, if you talk to a dog person, it's a different pitch than if you're talking to a cat person. And Andy, 
your message of what you've given us so far is so powerful that we could just end the conversation right now and people would take away tremendous value. However, I'm not going to let you off that easy because I know there's more there and I know my listeners do want more and they do want to put this in action. Uh, Andy, when, when a firm calls you in, so let's go back to the roadshow and let's go with the first scenario. They want help creating the roadshow. Where do you start? So the first thing I say, and I do the same with any communication, whether it's a roadshow or you know whatever, my first question is about the output. And it's very simple. What do you want to happen as a result of the roadshow? And very often they say, well, I want to tell them about my new strategy. And I say, I'll stop you there. I'm not asking about your message. I'm asking what impact you want the message to have. And they often will say, George, well, I want them to understand. And I go, no, I, what do you want them to do? Like, you know, they leave the room, they're motivated, they go to their desk. What do they do differently? And so I spend a long time on that. And how do we measure the success of that? And how are you going to embed that? So I spend a huge amount of time, George, talking about the impact. That's the first thing. Once we've got that, we then look back and we say, okay, well, we want to do a roadshow, but you've told me you want the impact to be long term. So my next question is, how are you going to follow up the roadshow afterwards to make sure you embed the long-term impact? So there's lots of questions talking about the future. Okay, get that in. And then when we start having a look at the roadshow, we then have a look at how we can create the communication. And I have certain structures that work. I can give you as much or as little as you want about these structures that work. But again, I'm always saying we have to tailor it to these blind people. So remember those two words, guess and ask. So which does each individual room want to know about, guess or ask, and then we can tailor it to each one. So step one, what's the end goal? Step two, how do you follow up the road, Joe? Step three, let's create a standard, but then step four, how do we tailor it to the different rooms? There may be other things we do as well, but you need all four of those, George. If you don't know where you're going, well, you don't get there. If you don't follow it up, I never understand why leaders do this. They expect long-term change because they did one 20-minute presentation once. Well, that doesn't work. Yeah, it's like you don't buy a house with a short-term credit card, do you? You know, you match the... If you want long-term change, we need long-term reinforcement. Yep, so you've got to know where you're going. We have to plan long-term reinforcement. We need a core presentation, which is good. But then we have to tailor it to each room. So there may be other steps as well, George, but we have to do each of those four. They're non-negotiable. Mm. And I'm going to repeat those four steps for people in case they missed it, because this yes. is worth writing down, Andy. One, you said identify the goal. Two, decide how you will follow up the presentation. Mm. That's critical. Three was the, um, uh, help me out there. I'm, I'm trying to read the here. presentation. You can now create the presentation. Yeah. Got it. And and then four. How do you tailor it to the different rooms? Tailor, tailor it. Yes, yes. Ah, critical. And yet so many people just uh, get their marketing department to pump out some slides and send it out and they tell everybody, give this message to everybody. That's right. So they have no end goal. They have no follow up. They have no tailoring and they have some standard thing which is being created by someone who hasn't asked or guessed at all what the audience wants, which when we talk about it now, it sounds really obvious, right? Why would anyone not do this? But you see, the thing is, when you have a look at how people do things, what people do is we're creatures of habits. As humans, we're creatures of habits. One of the biggest challenges for a leader is how to get your people to change because they are stuck in long-term habits. And habits are more powerful than anything. I mean, I know lots of leaders who have a meeting every Tuesday morning with their team that nobody really likes and nobody really values. And I say to them, why do you keep having it? And their only answer is because we always do. You know, well, just stop it. You know, I've spoken to salespeople and they say, we sent out a proposal and we based it on last week's, you know, we just changed the client logo and I say, oh, that's very clever. And the proposal from last week, did that win the sale? And they often say, George, no, it didn't. And I go, well, why are you copying something that lost? I mean, it's just ridiculous, but it shows the power of habit. So what we have to do is we, if we're going to do a roadshow to cause some long-term impact, we've got to change habits which means we need follow-up 
and we need to make it rigorous. And too many people look at a talk, a speech, a presentation as an event. And what I think I'm hearing is that it it's just a part of the process. Yes, there is a wonderful quote by the um, Irish author, a gentleman called George Bernard Shaw, and he said, the single biggest illusion with communication is the fact that it has taken place. In other words, let's use smaller language, the biggest mistake people make is they think they've done the communication, so it's finished. Okay? Or they do a 20-minute event and think that will change everybody for the next year. The world doesn't work that way. Yeah? But bluntly, habits are long-term things, and communication is a short-term thing. So we need rigorous reinforcement. And that's where, you know, another thing when I'm talking with leaders and how we're going to reinforce things, I say, what are the questions you're going to relentlessly ask to make sure people have adopted the new strategy? So let's say we have a new strategy and it's going to be, I don't know, we're going to speak to our customers more. Well, the leader needs to ask their team almost every single time they see them, how many customers have you contacted this week? You know, every time. So as you walk towards me, I want you thinking, Andy's going to ask me how many customers I've contacted, because he always does. There has to be this relentless, consistent follow-up, because as a leader, if you ignore bad behavior, you empower it, right? If you ignore bad behavior, you empower it. So if someone doesn't do what you want, if you ignore that, you're empowering them not to do what you want. So you have to continually reinforce it. Use charm. Be persuasive, but you can't just ignore it. Otherwise, you're saying you just carry on. And some people might disagree with that, Andy. They might say, well, I trust my people. They're a good team. I have to show them trust. I can't yeah. keep asking them about little details. I have to trust that they can do that. What do you say to that? I think it's a very valid point. If we think of a spectrum between total follow-up where you ring them every two minutes, say you're doing it, and zero follow-up is the other end, both those extremes are wrong, okay? So if you do no follow-up whatsoever, you may trust your team, but your team are made of humans, and humans are creatures of habit, and they weren't doing this new stuff for the last 39 years of their life, so you can trust them as much as you like, but habits rule everything, yeah? So it's not a question of uh, you don't trust them if you do a follow-up, but you can follow up with charm. How are you finding it? What impact has it had? What help is it bringing you? Do you have any concerns? What have you found works as a success I can share with other people? You know, these are very enabling questions to ask, not have you done it because I don't trust you. So if you think of a spectrum of too much follow up and too little follow up, you want it somewhere in between those two um, unacceptable extremes. So anyone who says I'm not following up, I strongly advise against that. And anyone who says they're going to follow up every two minutes, I really strongly So somewhere on the spectrum, but it's not enough to say I trust my team. I think that is abdicating responsibility as a leader. And Andy, I hear two key phrases in there. One is, what are you doing that's working well so that I can share it with others on the team? That's an encouraging conversation. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the other end of that would be what's not working or what are you avoiding and what's getting in the way? How can we make that easier for you? Yeah. How can I help you with that? And let's say you tell me, George, that you're having a problem with aspect number three, but I can say, well, I had a chat with one of your other colleagues and they are doing very well with aspect number three. Would you mind if I put you two together? Because there may be some quick wins you can get from having a chat with her. And so the nice thing about what's working, what isn't working, is it also enables your team to almost self-police and help each other. Um, whenever I'm doing any follow-up as a, as a leader, and the advice I give my leadership clients to follow up is what I call best next help. You know, best, what's working best that we can learn from. Next, you know, what are you planning to do next to keep doing it? And the final point is help, which is what you say, what do you need help with? What are you avoiding or what do you not feel comfortable with? And whether you use those words or not, best next help is really powerful as a follow-up. What's working? What are you doing next? And what do you need help with? You know? 
Mm. And Andy, it's coming out that, and you mentioned it earlier, you said communication is short term, mm-hmm. uh, whereas goals are, are long term. And too many people think that one or two times you deliver a message and I don't want to harp on this. I don't want to keep, mm-hmm. you know, don't want to be on everybody's back all the time. But the reality is the message needs to keep being sent, maybe even in different ways, but the same message needs to be repeated. Yeah, and in a way, and nobody wants to be annoying. We're not saying here be annoying. We're not saying hound people. You know, we don't want every time you see me, you almost want to hide because you know it's horrible. So we want to follow up appropriately. But as you say, you can do it in different ways. So for example, I know we've spoken about this before, you and I want thing I say to leaders is everybody in the outside world will judge you and your team and how good you are based on two things. Number one, how good you are at your job. And number two, how well you communicate. All right. So if you do a great job, but you summarize it with a terrible report, if I've only seen your report, I assume you've done a terrible job because the report was terrible. So how good you are and how you communicate a very close link, you need to be good at both. So this idea you just said here, it, let's say I'm working with a leadership team and I impress on them the importance of improving that communication because the better the communication, the better the outside perception. What we then do is we say we need to change our habits to improve communication. So it's not just me saying all the time, are you communicating well? We could do things like when we have a team meeting, we could change the agenda to include a standard agenda item, which is please share your greatest communication success of the previous month. You know, so everyone has to bring a success with them. We might say, we're going to have a communication share session. If you sent an email that got an instant reply, please, can you share it so we can learn from each other? All right, so it doesn't just have to be the leader asking questions. It can be agenda items. It can be share best practice. Um, Many of my leadership team clients have or they include what we now call an education slot. So when they get together with their leadership team, five minutes of the hour is given to one of the leaders educating everybody else about a new thing they've learned. Yeah? And that's really powerful because that way it's not coming just from the leader, it's coming from all the team. They always bring something of value. And imagine if that happened every time a leadership team got together. Andy, another powerful lesson. Yeah, every time you get together with your team have one of them share something that they've learned, even if it's only five minutes. And wow, that's a benefit from that because it's not the leader who's telling people what to do. It's the team itself saying, hey, here's what I learned. Here's what I discovered. And I'm sharing it with you. And now each one of those team members get to work on their communication skills as well. Mm. I love that. It works so well. And that's what I love about being a leader, the leader who brings that into the team. As you say, the leader doesn't do all the educating, but they've enabled it to happen. It wouldn't have happened without them. So if you think of the word leader, they have led that, they have made it happen, but they don't have to do the education slots themselves. In fact, it's better if they don't really. And again, another lesson, the leader has a more effective team when they become an enabler versus a dictator. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, we said before about how, you know, if you ask the same question, people begin to know. So one of the things I often say is leaders very often want to help their team, but they often do that, George, by giving them answers. So let's say a member of my team comes up and says, Andy, I've got a challenge with customer number 12. As a leader, it's very easy for me to say, let me help you with that and give you my wise advice because I'm a leader. And I think I'm being helpful and I think I'm being clever, but I'm actually stifling their initiative because I've given them the answer. So one of the things I have, and if any of my team ever meet you, George, and say, if you say to them, does Andy say this? I <laughs> say yes, all the time. When my team comes to me with a challenge, I always say, what three solutions have you thought of? So if they say we've got a problem with customer 12, she isn't replying to my call. I say, what three things have you thought of? And if they say, I've not thought of anything. I say, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go and think of three ideas? I'll think of three ideas and we'll have a chat in five minutes and see if we've got a good outcome here. And when my clients ring up with coaching and they say, Andy, help me, I've got a challenge with this. I say, what three things have you thought of? It's really empowering as a leader because it's not enough what one or two. The way the human brain works, we tend to think in twos, you know, fight and flight. So if someone says, I've got a challenge with this, if you say what three things, it 
forces them just to think a bit more than they would have done. And it's so enabling as a leader. It's empowering your team. Mm. And so now they have ownership of the solution. Absolutely. And people are really committed to things they've come up with. You know, if I want my children to tidy the bedroom, if I say tidy the bedroom, they might, they might not. They won't be happy with it if they do. But you mentioned before about my mum. If one of them comes to me uh, and I want them to tidy their bedroom, I could say this. Um, so my mum, like your granny, is coming this weekend. There's lots of stuff all over the floor. We can't have stuff over the floor when a blind person comes. That's just totally unacceptable. Um, I don't want you to tidy your room now because you're doing other stuff. You tell me, when will be a good time for you to tidy it up for granny? And they will think about it and they'll tell me, but they say, I'll tidy it up this afternoon. Now they're really likely to do it, George, because they're the ones who came up with it, you know? So it's the same thing if you're a leader. If you say to your team, what do you think of? And if they think it's a good idea, you say, great, do you need anything from me? Okay, off you go then. So powerful. And it'll be interesting. Some parents listening to this might just be thinking, forget this leadership stuff. I'm just going to do this with my children tonight. <laughs> yes, and, and I can see that that conversation with your daughter is powerful. One is because you've subtly given her the why behind yes. the reason. Granny's coming and she's mm -hmm. blind and we don't want her hurting mm -hmm. herself. And your choice, when you do it, when would you do it? And so now you've given them control. You're, you're not the dictator. There's nothing to push back against. That's right. And I remember someone asking me once, I like that technique, Andy. How can I make it easy to remember? And I said, well, you know, when people talk about body odor, you know, B-O, if you think of the B-O, B stands for benefits, like granny's coming soon, we want her to be happy. And then you give them options. That's what the O stands for, options. When do you want to tidy your bedroom, now or in 20 minutes? So benefit and options is a really simple B-O. It's very childish, I realize, George, B-O, but it's a very good technique. So again, if you're talking to someone and you want to meet with them again, you might say something like, so you've asked how I can help you with this. Let me look into that for you. Find some new ideas. When do you want us to get back together? Later on this week, beginning of next week, when's good for you? So I'm giving you the benefit. I'm going to come up with new ideas and then come the options. When should we meet again? Yep, yeah, want your children to go to bed. Don't say go to bed. They don't want to go to bed. But instead you say, it's time for your favorite story. I'm so excited to read it to you. Do you want to go upstairs? Do you want me to carry you? Or should we have a race? You know, when the children get all excited. But what am I really saying, George? Bedtime. Mm. Parents, listen up here. How to say bedtime yeah. without saying bedtime. <laughs> You're welcome, parents. You're very welcome. Andy, earlier on, you hinted at various structures for a presentation or a message. Give us one or two of those, uh, if you can, just to get us thinking. Certainly. So I've given one already, which is the follow-up thing, which is Best Next Help. That works beautifully. Best Next Help also works well with a one-to-one. -one. So if you're my leader and we're having a one-to-one, -one, um, you could ask me to prepare what I think has been my Best Next Help for the month. Yep. And you can prepare what you think has been my best next help. And that's a really rich structure for a one-to-one. -one. Because sometimes one-to-one, -one, the leader goes, what should we talk about? You know, any challenges? No. But if I give you a one-minute summary of what I think I've done well, what my next month priority and where I need help, and then you tell me what you think as my leader I've done well, then that's a really rich discussion. So best next help, that's good. Another one, where this one works very well when you're doing things like town halls, strategy stuff, when you're looking ahead in the future. So there's four four things. I'll run through them, the words, and then I'll give you a bit more detail. Number one, why it's needed. Number two, the end game. Number three, the journey. Number four, the battles. So I'll go through that. Number one, why it's needed. So if there's a new strategy rollout, why are we doing this new strategy? Okay, because if you don't address why it's needed, I can guarantee everyone's looking at you going, why are we doing this new strategy? What's wrong with the old one? So why are we doing it, which will usually be opportunity or threat? We've got a new opportunity or we've got a threat. We can't stay still. Why it's needed. Number two is future vision. And our future vision is this is where we want it to be. The end goal, if you like. Number three is the journey. That's how we're going to get from here to there. So this is the, you know, the timeline stuff and so on. This is what we're doing and this is who's doing what. And then the final one, the objections, the concerns, the barriers, the problems, 
what you need to do as a leader is when you're talking about the future, you want to preempt, so proactively bring up yourself the challenges you know they're going to be thinking and then get rid of them. So for example, it might go like this. Let's say the new strategy. We start with why it's needed. We've got a really good opportunity here. One of our customers has recently been fined because they didn't hit the regulation targets. We can get ahead of them. Their reputation is struggling. And also, of course, we must make sure we don't get fined. That's why we're looking at the new strategy. Number two, the vision. My vision for this is we're the market leader 12 months from now. We have zero fines. We have zero stress. And everyone sees we'd really pulled ahead from them. Now, let's have a look at number three, the journey. Let's show you the key milestones we need to achieve to be able to go on this path. And then number four, we have the barriers and say, this all sounds great, but of course we have two problems. Number one, time. None of us have time to do this. And number two, we also have priority X. How do we fit alongside that? Well, let me talk to you about that. And the reason you do the potential barriers, George, that final one, is if I don't, as the leader, say, I know your word about time, everyone who hears the town hall will go, when does Andy think we're going to do this? We haven't got time for this. So unless you, what we call the elephant in the room, unless you proactively bring it up and remove it, I can guarantee they'll leave the room and say, well, we haven't got time, and what about Project X? But if you say, I know we all have some concerns about time, so let me show you how I'm going to give you more capacity to enable this to happen. Okay, so why it's needed, where we're going, how we'll get there, and then finally overcoming that concerns. Mm, and so that structure addresses the key questions in the minds of your audience, which they then might be sitting there and saying, that's exactly what I was going to ask. How did he know that? Yeah, it's like magic. Yeah, it, and it's because they are thinking, whether they know it or not, why are, we, why are we doing it? They're thinking, what are we trying to achieve? So what are the steps then? But what about Project X? I mean, they're the main questions that are going through their minds, yeah? And I love that. And what I love you said before about if we can start off with slide one about something they're interested in. So if I was talking to the sales team, slide one says how you'll make more sales faster, and then I have exactly the same stuff in the middle, those four steps, and I am with the call to action. When I do the finance team, this is how our finances will approve. And then it's the same four steps, and then it's their call to action. Yeah, it's such a beautiful, simple way to do it. But then you still need the follow what we talked about before. Okay, so they're two very simple techniques. Best next help is great when you want a little update or a one-to-one. -one. And when you're going forward, looking forward like a new strategy or a new vision thing, those four things work beautifully. Mm, powerful ideas. Andy, for people who might be interested in, in your books, um, your latest book, how will it help them the most? Um, well, it will help them achieve more every time they speak. Uh, so there you go. That's the elevator pitch. Um, so I've written three books. They're all on Amazon. If you just type my name into Amazon, they all come up on the same page. Um, the last one, which is called Top Dog, that is very much how to impress other top dogs. So if you're a leader, but you're talking to someone who is senior to you, it can be quite scary. So that book focuses on how to impress people when you think they're more important than you. The one which is most similar to what we've been talking about today is the middle one, the snowball effect. Um, what that does is it helps you make, you said it beautifully before, George, just tiny changes to communication. If you make lots of tiny changes, you get this sort of momentum snowball. You know, you just can't help but get better and better. And that's what that book is. Um, the first book is probably, uh, I think it's, my favorite one, because it was my first one, it might be a little bit basic for some of the people on this call, but this was the one that got beaten by Harry Potter. I should say, though, when it got beaten by Harry Potter, it might have been second place to Harry Potter, but the number of copies we sold was something like 80 billion fewer. So we might have been beaten, but we were beaten by a substantial way. I don't think that Warner Brothers are making any films about the first book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> And you can find the link to the books and Andy's site in the description below. You can also reach out to Andy on LinkedIn, and you can find his that link to his profile below as well. Andy, as we prepare to wrap up, if you could sit down with a team leader 
who wants to bring change to the team for whatever reason. The market's changing and there's new technology. Gee, does that sound like these times at all? Uh, yeah, that the, sounds my day job, yeah. <laughs> and uh, if you could give that team leader one, two, or three pieces of advice of how they can deliver this message about change and actually get the change that they want. What might be that one, two piece or three pieces of advice? Perhaps it's something you've said already. So certainly the stuff we talked about already will work. So those steps like what's your end goal? How are you going to follow it up? Get your communications, communications created in turn. So that stuff is very relevant. Um, focusing on the different steps of the communications, again, we talked it's all very relevant. Maybe one new thing to add to everyone here is as a leader, there are three things all leaders must do, I think. They have to role model. So behave as you want your team to behave. Secondly, they have to proactively, relentlessly lead. So set expectations and carry on following up and so on. And the third thing they have to do is instantly react. So if they see someone slip back or do something that you don't like, instantly react because if you ignore it you empower it so you can say it with charm but if someone's forgotten to do what you've agreed you are almost negligent as a leader to not step in because otherwise they'll just keep slipping back so the final thing i would say to anyone if you do have a new thing you're looking to embed we talked about good communication stuff today but remember that you have to role model this so you have to embed it yourself you can't be like the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz, which says, go on, magic flying monkeys, you go and fly, and I'll stay in my castle doing magic leadership stuff. You know, you've got to be a magic flying monkey as well. So you've got to role model it. You've got to embrace it, because they'll copy it. Secondly, get your communications right, launch it, follow it up. But remember, and it's so important, you must remember to instantly react. Because if someone slips back and you say, nothing... They're just going to keep slipping back and other people will follow them. So it's not a bad rule for life as a leader, right? Role model, lead and react is not bad for any aspects of leadership. They will copy you. They will do what you say. And if you don't step in when they slip back, you'll think they don't mind. Mm, powerful advice. My guest today is Andy Bounds, reminding you to uh, keep the structure in mind. Best next health. If you like what you heard, Tell your friends and post your five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps more listeners find us. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok. 